Although the immigrants rejoiced over their freedom from the pagans, life in Medina presented several difficulties. They had left their homes and belongings and now had to start all over again. Most of them had been traders, while the main occupation in Medina was date cultivation. Furthermore, the climate did not suit the newcomers, many of whom were soon stricken with fever. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was aware of a great sense of displacement among the Muhajirin, the immigrants, and he made the following prayer. O Allah, make Medina as dear to us as Makkah was, or even dearer. Make its climate salubrious and bless its fruits and grains. Allah granted the Prophet, peace be upon him's prayer. The immigrants regained their health and began to love Medina. As they became engaged in establishing social and emotional ties in Medina, they found the city becoming more and more of a home to them. Soon after arriving in Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, began the process of setting up the first Muslim state. First, he launched the construction of a mosque. He bought the land where his she camel had knelt down, about 100 cubits in length and breadth. There were a few graves located on the land which had to be moved, as well as some date trees that had to be replanted. The mosque's walls were made of earth and unbaked bricks. Its roof was made from branches of date trees and tree trunks served as columns. Sand and pebbles were spread on the floor. The mosque had three doors and the qibla, a niche in the wall where the leader of the prayer stands, was made to face in the direction of Beit al Maqdis, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. The Prophet, peace be upon him, worked along with the Muhajirin, the Meccan immigrants, and the Ansar, the Muslims of Medina, building the mosque. While they carried bricks, rocks, and tree trunks, they chanted work songs to make their toil easier. Two apartments were also built near the mosque for the Prophet, peace be upon him's two wives, Sota bint Zama and Aisha bint Abu Bakr, whom the Prophet, peace be upon him, married soon after he arrived in Medina. These apartments were built of stone, mud and date palms. At last, the Muslims had a house of worship all their own. They no longer had to congregate surreptitiously as they had in Mecca at Beit al-Arqam. In Medina, they began to perform all five prayers in congregation in the Prophet peace be upon him's mosque. The only problem was that the people were unsure of when each prayer would begin. The Prophet, peace be upon him, asked his followers for suggestions on how to solve this problem. Some suggested that a shell or conch should be blown. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, ever direct, proposed that someone should be appointed to call out loudly, prayer is about to begin. The Prophet, peace be upon him, liked Umar's idea and put it into practice. Later, however, Abdullah bin Zaid bin Abdurrabi al-Ansari had a dream in which he heard a beautiful prayer call. He related this dream to the Prophet, peace be upon him, who realised that the dream was meant to be fulfilled. He asked Abdullah to teach the words to Bilal bin Rabah, may Allah be pleased with him, who had a strong and beautiful voice. Bilal learned the words and called out to the Muslims of Medina. Allah is the most great. Allah is the most great. I testify that there is no deity except Allah. I testify that there is no deity except Allah. I testify that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. I testify that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Come to the prayer. Come to the prayer. Come to the success. Come to the success. Allah is most great. Allah is most great. There is no deity except Allah. When Umar heard the new prayer call, he hurried to the mosque and said, By Allah, I have heard this call in my dreams. From that day onward, Muslims gathered at the mosque whenever they heard Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, make the prayer call. The Ansar tried to outdo each other in making the Muhajirin comfortable in Medina and put themselves and their possessions at the service of the newcomers. Their generosity is mentioned in the following verse of the Qur'an. The Ansar 
love the Muhajireen who sought refuge with them, and there is no jealousy in their hearts for what the Muhajireen have been given. The Ansar give the Muhajireen preference over themselves, although they were in need of what the Muhajireen received. Quran 59, colon 9. The Prophet, peace be upon him, helped create a strong bond between the 45 immigrants and their hosts by assigning each immigrant to a particular family in Medina. Each immigrant, therefore, was declared a member of the family he was assigned to. They were to share each other's grief and suffering and they were even allowed to inherit from each other. Later, however, the permission to inherit from each other was abrogated by a verse in the Qur'an limiting inheritance to blood kin. The brotherhood that was born between the Ansar and Muhajirin was no superficial bond based on sufferance of the Prophet peace be upon him's instructions, but a deep sense of kinship that is difficult to imagine today. The Ansar felt such a great responsibility for their Muqqan protégés that once they even went to the Prophet peace be upon him and offered to give half of their precious date groves to the Muhajirin. When the Prophet peace be upon him would not allow them to do so, they made a second suggestion. The Muhajirin could do some work in the groves and receive a share from the Prophets as compensation. The Prophet peace be upon him accepted this proposal. Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah was a wealthy Ansari, singular form of Ansar. He was paired with an immigrant, Abdul Rahman bin Auf. Sa'ad not only offered Abdul Rahman his possessions, but also offered him one of his wives. I have two wives, he said. Tell me who is more pleasing to you, and I shall divorce her so that you may marry her. Abdul Rahman did not take advantage of his host's generosity. May Allah bless your family and your possessions. Just tell me where the market is. Like most Makkans, he was a skilled merchant, and soon he was able to support himself with his earnings from the market. Shortly thereafter, he married a woman from the Ansar. The brotherhood between individual immigrants and their host families created a strong sense of community that was further consolidated when the Prophet, peace be upon him, instituted common rules of conduct for all. However, Medina was also home to two other communities, the polytheists, who had not accepted Islam, and the Jewish tribes. In order to avoid the kind of conflicts the Muslims had experienced in Makkah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, entered into a covenant with these two communities. The following points were included in the document. The Ansar and any of the tribes who signed a treaty with them were a distinct Ummah, nation. The payment of blood money and the release of prisoners between them and the Muslims would take place according to past practice, and the two non-Muslim communities of Medina would help the Muslims in matters of ransom and blood money. 2. All three communities of Medina would unite against any criminals, rebels or hostile armies even if they should be their own offspring. 3. No Muslim was allowed to kill another Muslim to aid a non-Muslim, nor could he help a non-Muslim against a Muslim. 4. The obligations owed to Allah were common to all Muslims, and the entire community was responsible for the discharge of this duty if an individual failed to carry out his responsibility. 5. Jews who became Muslims would be treated as any other Muslim. 6. Booty would be shared by all Muslims. 7. One who deliberately killed a Muslim would be killed unless the victim's family forgave the killer. It was incumbent upon the Muslims to rise against the killer. 8. It was unlawful for a Muslim to support anyone who tried to create dissension among Muslims or anyone who attempted to tamper with the tenets of Islam. 9. Allah and his Prophet, peace be upon him, would settle all disputes arising among any of the three communities. The covenant marked a turning point for the Muslims. They were bound to each other by a solemn undertaking, and through the course of later events, they would prove that the unity, brotherhood and cooperation sown by the covenant had flowered and borne fruit.
As for the position of the Muslims vis-à-vis -vis the non-Muslims, the covenant that the Muslims were strong enough to set their own terms. It was made apparent to the polytheists that they would not be able to challenge the Muslims' authority. Most of the chieftains and notables of Medina had become Muslim, and there was no one capable of leading those opposed to Islam in open rebellion. Realising this, the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted to ensure that non-Muslims who were discontent with the new power structure did not look to Makkah for help. He made the non-Muslims agree to the following stipulation. We will not shelter the Quraysh, nor will we refuse to offer protection to Muslims. The Prophet, peace be upon him, drew up a separate covenant between the Muslims and the Jews. 1. The Jews and Muslims would live together as two separate nations, each with its own way of life and each in charge of its own financial affairs. 2. Both nations would jointly defend the city from attack and each would defend its own people. 3. Both nations would coexist peacefully and neither was to meddle in the affairs of the other or in any way attempt to destabilize the other. 4. Neither nation was responsible for the misdeeds of the other. 5. The oppressed would be helped and supported. 6. Both nations would bear the expenses of war. 7. Subversion and unwarranted bloodshed were unlawful for both nations. 8. All disputes would be referred to Allah and his Prophet, peace be upon him. 9. The Quraysh and their allies were not to be aided or given refuge. 10. The covenant would not provide any safeguard to wrongdoers or criminals. This covenant united the three communities of Medina and defined the Prophet, peace be upon him, as the undisputed head of state. Once everyone understood his rights and responsibilities, the Prophet, peace be upon him, began to actively call the other two communities to Islam. Many embraced Islam and those who preferred their own religion lived in peace with the ruling Muslims. There were others, however, who were interested neither in Islam nor peaceful coexistence. A faction from them became Muslim so as to weaken Islam from within. They were later known as the hypocrites. Their leader was Abdullah bin Ubay, and together with a group of hostile non-Muslims, they represented the greatest threat to the security of Medina. In spite of all the precautions the Prophet, peace be upon him, took to ensure that Medina remained safe and peaceful, the Quraysh were determined to destabilize the city. The Quraysh sent word to the polytheists of Medina, ordering them to help drive out the Muslims. If the polytheists refused to help, the Quraysh threatened to kill their children and capture their women. The Prophet, peace be upon him, found out about the threats and convinced the polytheists not to give in to the strong arm tactics employed by the Quraysh. The Quraysh seethed at the turn of events. Their frustration was apparent when Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, may Allah be pleased with him, went to Mecca to perform Umrah, the minor pilgrimage. As he circumambulated the Kaaba with Abu Safwan Umayyah bin Khalaf, he met Abu Jal. Abu Jal recognised him as one of the residents of Medina, who had become Muslim and accosted Sa'ad. So you find safety in Mecca while you have provided refuge to the faithless? By God, if you were not with Abu Safwan, you would not return home safe and sound. Abu Jahl's threat indicated that the Quraysh were intent on keeping the Muslims away from visiting the Kaaba and performing their religious duties there. It also indicated that they were prepared to kill unarmed Muslims. The Jews of Medina also represented another threat to the Muslims. They played on the old rivalry between the two tribes of Medina the Aus and Khazraj, hoping to rekindle the bitter feud that had once rent them. The fledgling Muslim community faced threats from both within and without. The danger of bloodshed grew so serious that the Muslims began keeping their weapons next to their beds at night. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was also protected by armed bodyguards until Allah revealed the verse. Allah will guard you from mankind. Quran. 
67.